So we're starting to record now. And Michael, if you want to start sharing your screen. There we go. Is that coming through okay? Excellent, that's perfect. Brilliant. So um, well, thank you, you, Susan. Um, brilliant, thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate the invitation from, from NOSASP and from, from ARC to come give this talk um, about Cranogs in, in Highland, Scotland. Um, and I'm framing it very much around this character, Odo Blundell, because um, even to the present day, um, so much of what we know about Cranogs in, in the Highland region um, are, uh, is as a result of, of Blundell's work. Um, uh, in addition to that, he's a, a very notable figure in the world of underwater archaeology um, for his pioneering efforts um, in getting underwater, and, and I'll cover that uh, in this talk. The talk kind of breaks down into, into three parts. The first part uh, is very much a biography of Blundell um, uh, and his, in his Cranog research legacy. Um, and then I'll go on to, to review uh, the work and, and research that's been done on Cranogs in, in the Highland region since Blundell uh, to the present um, before uh, taking on in the final part, um, very much a chronological period by period, um, Michael Stratagos's research questions for Cranogs uh, in Highland uh, and that uh, sort of uh, uh, very much in the vein of the regional archaeological research framework um, that's being um, put together now um, e e by Susan. Um, uh, so uh, the, the talk falls into those three parts. Um, a, a, and, but the first thing to do really is to um, a, do a bit of definition of terms. Uh, when I say Highland, um, for the purposes of this talk tonight, um, I will be almost exclusively um, referring to uh, um, a, a Highland Council region as opposed to uh, other types of definitions of, of Highland um, regions in Scotland. Um, uh, so I'm very specifically speaking about uh, the Highland Council area um, as opposed to any other definition. Um, the other thing to define is Cranog. Uh, I'm sure most of you will have uh, an idea um, or a very good idea or knowledge of what a Cranog is, but some of you may not. Um, so uh, what you're looking at on the right, there is a Cranog. Um, if you've traveled in Scotland at all, you all almost certainly have passed by one, uh, even if you know you didn't. Um, it, they exist as these rocky islets um, in freshwater locks mostly, although you do get them in, in marine contexts as well. Um, and uh, they, at their broadest definition, you could call them uh, artificial island dwellings. Um, uh, these things are almost entirely or usually entirely artificial. Um, every stone and timber brought to site um, uh, and, and they are typically lived on or um, some other kind of activity or function is carried out on them. Um, so with those two uh, definitions um, uh, out of the way, we'll move on uh, to discuss Otto Blundell. Who was this guy? Um, he was born in, in Lancashire in 1868 to a very prominent Catholic family, um, prominent uh, in the religious conflicts of the um, uh, 16th and 17th centuries in England. Um, uh, he was a, the 10th child um, in the Blundell family, um, and he... Uh, it was a very pious Catholic family. Um, his sister uh, also joined the Benedictine order, um, joining a convent in England um, a few years before he moves to Fort Augustus to join the novitiate at St. Benedict's Abbey um, in 1890. Uh, and this seems like a slightly odd place to end up if you were born in Lancashire to a Catholic family. Why go to the shores of Loch Ness? Um, and there is another family connection, uh, which I think is responsible for that. Uh, uh, one of uh, the St. Benedict's Abbey at Fort Augustus was established, um, sponsored, if you will, by uh, Lord Lovett. Um, the, the Lord Lovett, who, who put together the money to start this abbey, uh, uh, desperately wanted for some reason to restart monastic, Catholic monastic activities in Scotland. Um, and he was married to a Weld Blundell, um, a relative of, of Odo's. Um, uh, so I suspect that uh, that family connection is, is why he ended up in Scotland. Um, 
most of the biographical details that uh, I'm covering and will cover uh, uh, appear in, uh, I'm taking from uh, the only biography that I'm aware of, of Odo Blundell, which was published in 2005 in the Innis Review. Uh, and I suggest um, tracking that down if you're interested in Blundell um, uh, and want to do some more reading on him. Um, but the picture that emerges from uh, that biography and uh, uh, of the other details that I've come across of Blundell's life is a very active um, uh, guy. He moves to Fort Augustus in 1890 uh, and immediately sets upon researching um, Catholic history um, in Scotland. Um, and he goes, uh, travels very widely, uh, undoubtedly encountering numerous Cranogs, but this doesn't seem to uh, uh, take up his research time. He was interested uh, in these ancient Catholic families and their settlements. Um, he also traveled widely as part of his, of his mission, um, uh, conducting Catholic masses around um, uh, the Highland region. Um, he also was very active um, in, uh, from around the beginning of the, tw the 20th century uh, as a naval chaplain. Um, he was pioneering in this aspect of his life as well. He said the first Catholic mass on a Royal Navy vessel um, since, the reign of, since the reign of King James II. Uh, I believe, uh, in the 17th century. Um, so, uh, uh, and it, it's this Catholic history that he's arguably actually more famous for than his Cranog research. Uh, in addition to the, the Catholic uh, Scottish research that he did, he also published three volumes on Catholic Lancashire um, following his time uh, living in Scotland. Um, uh, and I think partly because of this is, is one of the reasons why he's, he's maybe slightly forgotten amongst um, uh, uh, maritime archaeologists, underwater archaeologists, and archaeologists in Scotland, um, because he has this this really quite significant body of work that he did uh, that has nothing to do with with archaeology for the most part, and, and certainly Cranogs. Um, uh, but it, it, it's definitely worth worth reiterating just how active uh, his his monastic life was. He was not just cloistered up at, at Saint Benedict's. Um, he ran the Abbey's farm for twenty years in addition to all of this as well. Um, so how did he end up uh, uh, investigating Cranogs at all? Um, uh, it's a fair question um, for somebody who's ostensibly interested in, in Catholic history. Why did he start um, studying Cranogs? And that has a very interesting connection, I think. Um, it's not explicitly written down anywhere, but I, I strongly suspect this to be the case. In 1890, when, when Blundell turns up at Fort Augustus, uh, at the same time, a, a very elderly man named John Mickey uh, also turns up at Fort Augustus to join St. Benedict's as a lay brother. Now, John Mickey lived his life in Aberdeenshire, um, and in the middle of the 19th century uh, was around Loch Canord um, when the lock was lowered um, and new discoveries were made uh, that included um, a set five log boats um, and numerous uh, uh, oak timbers from the two Cranogs in the loch there. Um, and he wrote um, an entire book about that as kind of the centerpiece called The Antiquities of Loch Canord. Um, and uh, so it's no doubt in my mind that uh, John Mickey uh, introduced Cranogs to Odo Blundell um, and in the 20 years that they spent together at St. Benedict's on the shore of Loch Ness, um, Mickey was in Blundell's ear saying, you should go investigate Cherry Island, um, which was just a kilometer away from the Abbey um, and happens to be the only Cranog in Loch Ness. Um, so uh, uh, the other bizarre connection uh, is that it was Loch Canord that actually formed a, a, a greater, uh, a really important case study in my own PhD research. And I went and did underwater um, work at Loch Canord um, for that, um, just to bring it all full circle for you. Um, so it's in a, a 18, and so excuse me, 1908 uh, that Blundell finally um, has a chance to do some work on Cherry Island when he borrows uh, some diving equipment from some workers who were doing maintenance on the Caledonian Canal in Fort Augustus. Uh, and you can see something of the kind of diving uh, apparatus vintage that Blundell would have used. Uh, this is from about 20 years earlier, but I don't think um, uh, the, the general setup would have been much different from for Blundell in, in 1908. Um, uh, and there's also, just as an aside, a, a Cranog connection to that photograph on the right there. Uh, 
um, the lair of uh, Loch Tay was the site of a, a, a maintenance pier for the paddle steamers that went up and down Loch Tay and is about 100 meters away from uh, a Cranog, uh, Mary's distaff in Loch Tay, one of the 18 Cranogs in Loch Tay, uh, and is also the site of where the Scottish Cranog Centre is, is looking to move um, to a new centre um, as an aside. Um, but yes, so in 1908, Blundell borrows this diving apparatus and, a, and an amateur crew. Uh, and I can actually read um, some of, uh, uh, what, uh, of Blundell's report on that first dive, um, which has, uh, again, um, strong connections to my own experience. Uh, he writes uh, in his uh, Proceedings of Society's Antiquaries paper, the first descent was made in about 12 feet of water on the west side of the island. Um, but owing to the inexperience of the amateurs at the air pump, little serious work was done. Uh, the excess of air which was supplied to me had the effect of making me so buoyant that I was floating over the tops of the stones instead of stepping on them firmly. Um, so this is a, a very common experience for those of us who've, who've dove on Cranogs, um, uh, not getting your buoyancy right. Um, is, is uh, very common. Um, it's very difficult in shallow water to get uh, absolutely perfect. Um, but Blundell persevered um, and he conducted a series of dives in August um, and he did so in a very systematic way. He had a hypothesis uh, that Cherry Island was artificial uh, and he tested it by going underwater. Um, and in that respect, uh, he, could be, he could probably claim to be the first underwater archeologist uh, there had been numerous other individuals who um, had gotten reports from uh, uh, divers who'd gone underwater um, uh, and reported uh, archaeological findings from that. There were um, plenty of salvage expeditions um, uh, on the Mary Rose, for example, amongst many other um, uh, uh, maritime losses. Um, a, but in terms of asking an archeological question and going yourself underwater to answer it, um, Bledel is arguably the first. There's really only a, one other claimant, um, a, a German man um, who did some work on uh, an ancient Greek harbor uh, in the middle of the 19th century. That would be the only other person who maybe has an earlier claim. Um, and and Blundell certainly did a better job of, of publishing his results. Um, uh, so uh, in many ways, you could, you could say that Blundell was the first underwater archaeologist. Um, and uh, following his dives, he was very certain that Cherry Island was absolutely artificial. He found timbers emerging out of the, the submerged Cranog mound here, there, and everywhere. Um, and this spurred him on to do a lot more Cranog research. Um, uh, the next site that he dived on uh, was Loch Bruick, um, uh, uh, on uh, just to the north of, of Loch Ness, not far again from, from Fort Augustus. Uh, this has an incredible story unto itself. Uh, they had to cart the diving apparatus um, nearly 10 miles um, up a track. Loch Bruick's at uh, nearly 300 meters above sea level. There was a, a, a mighty storm uh, that hit on the day. Uh, and yet, despite all of that, uh, Blundell got underwater um, and uh, uh, did some investigation of the Cranog in that loch. Um, he dived in a handful of other sites, but, but arguably his, his greater contribution in, in many respects was to, um, uh, to survey a, a great number of sites that he uh, had identified with help from, uh, from local people. Um, he put together a, essentially a pro forma response form uh, sent it out widely across uh, the, uh, the country, across Scotland, to people that he knew, uh, had them fill it out and send it back to him. Uh, and in this way, he um, uh, identified 80, um, 87 sites from 61 individuals that he publishes in a, in a Proceedings of Society of Antiquaries of Scotland paper in, in 1913. Um, uh, and he published uh, and, and publicized these results in, in um, uh, news articles in the Oban Times and the Inverness Courier. Uh, he was very active in, in the Northern Scientific Societies, including the Inverness Field Club. Um, he was doing public archaeology uh, in the early 20th century, um, working quite closely with um, local people, um, landowners, tenant farmers, uh, medical doctors, uh, a whole range of, of uh, people from different professions. Um, 
And it's really uh, uh, quite sad because it seemed in, in 1913, 1914, uh, as he was planning on uh, doing a major excavation with funding from the British Association to excavate at Loch Kennelan, uh, that uh, war called him away uh, and his uh, participation in the naval chaplaincy um, uh, ended up putting him on HMS Collingwood, uh, where he was present for the Battle of Jutland. Uh, and he spends the entire First World War um, uh, in active service effectively for the chaplaincy um, and following the war does not return to Fort Augustus. Um, he ends up uh, uh, in Liverpool and in other places in England. Um, so that excavation lot Kennelan did go ahead. Um, uh, he left it with his collaborator, Hugh Fraser, um, and you really wonder what might have been. Um, uh, Hugh Fraser got input from Blundell via uh, correspondence, as well as Robert Monroe, who was uh, long retired by that point, very famous antiquarian who did Cranog excavations in southwest Scotland. Um, and Locke Kennelan uh, had historical references to uh, the Earls of Ross. Uh, apparently, Robert the Bruce visited um, uh, in the 14th century. Um, and uh, really incredible finds that included uh, an ivory chess piece, these incredible timbers, uh, huge caches of hazelnuts uh, and uh, uh, animal bones, um, a, a really incredible site um, uh, that uh, Hugh Fraser, who was just a schoolmaster himself, um, excavated. Um, so Blundell did eventually return to Fort Augustus um, uh, in 1942. Um, he ends up moving back um, in part to escape um, the Blitz. Uh, he was living in Liverpool at the time in 1941 um, and absconds to Scotland uh, to get away from, um, from the bombings uh, and ends up uh, in uh, Fort Augustus in, in 1942. He dies in very early in 1943 uh, at St. Benedict's Abbey and, he, and he's buried you can just see it in the bottom left-hand corner at the, the graveyard there, he's buried uh, on the shores of Loch Ness. Um, it's at this point that I have to uh, inform you of a very troubling sort of coda to this story, uh, which is that St. Benedict's um, was the venue for uh, child uh, sex abuse um, and physical abuse with allegations stretching back to the 1950s. Uh, and I highlight that just because I think it'd be unfair um, in this talk, which is ostensibly a, a celebration of Blundell um, and his Cranog research, to not um, you know, give you that context uh, uh, that the institution that supported that um, also was involved in, in those really heinous crimes um, that's a uh, subject of ongoing investigation. Um, and so I think it would be a disservice to the victims uh, of that abuse and, and to you, the audience, to, to not give you that context. Uh, and also to let you know, if you if you do your own research following this talk um, about Fort Augustus and, and St. Benedict's Abbey, that you will come across um, those really um, uh, horrific things that happened there. Um, so uh, not to draw a line under that, uh, and in real stark contrast um, to those horrific things, um, Blundell's Cranog research legacy is, is really overwhelmingly positive. Um, his diving uh, and systematic approach to Cranog research um, is, is something to be emulated, um, absolutely. Uh, his research uh, was largely focused on putting dots on the map, um, and we'll explore that and, and why that's important um, in a bit. Uh, he had these stymied excavation plans. He, he excavated um, a handful of sites in, in a very small way, um, but the big excavation at Loch Kennelan uh, 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 world events overtook him, um, and there's certainly parallels to the, uh, our present situation in that. Another big aspect of Blundell's research is, is grappling with this issue of artificial or not. Um, you know, to, to qualify as a Cranog, does the site need to be artificial? Um, uh, and this is something that uh, has occupied a lot of Cranog researchers' time, uh, including my own, um, and we'll go into that as well. Um, chronology, Blundell is, is mostly a question mark. Um, uh, he doesn't really deal with it. Uh, he doesn't mention it much. There's, if, if you read between the lines, there's a presumption that they're medieval um, sites. Uh, and that's certainly the case. There are medieval chronos. But with the advent of radiocarbon dating, 
um, it has become very clear that there's a prehistoric uh, uh, emergence of Kranogs um, that, uh, and, and they're, they're simply used into and through the medieval period as well. Um, and then really, I think uh, one of the, the greatest things of, of Blundell's legacy is this, um, is this public archeology span and this engagement um, with local people uh, not only to gather information, um, but also to ask research questions um, and to conduct the research. Uh, and that is a paradigm which uh, was way ahead of its time for the early 20th century and is in a lot of ways, um, you know, the kind of the, um, uh, uh, the gold standard in terms of what we try and do as professional archaeologists today, uh, especially in uh, research archaeology. Uh, so in terms of diving and underwater archaeology in the Highland region since Blundell, there was almost nothing, there's virtually nothing until the work of Nick Dixon in the 1990s at Lockendorp, which is on the right here, um, uh, following the discovery of some ceramics in the, uh, 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 around the island. Uh, uh, Nick was commissioned by then Historic Scotland to do an underwater survey, and he did. Uh, they found more ceramics. Nick is also very convinced that the entire island is artificial. Uh, it seems quite crazy, um, but Lockendorp would not be the biggest Cranog in, in Scotland. There are others that are larger. Um, and if it's not entirely artificial, then it seems to be mostly artificial. Uh, in addition to the ceramics, Nick also found a, a timber boat knee um, uh, and trebuchet shot, solid stone trebuchet shot, um, suggesting uh, and, and corroborating uh, historic records of, of uh, some conflict that took place along the shores of Loch and Dorb uh, during the time it was occupied. Uh, much more recently, Mark Thacker has, has undertaken some research on uh, uh, charcoal, radiocarbon dating of charcoal from mortar um, that had fallen out of the masonry. Um, uh, and this uh, uh, seems to suggest as well a kind of 12th or 13th century initial construction of the castle and corroborating the broad um, uh, documentary understanding of, of when that site was, was first built. There may very well be earlier phases um, at Loch and Dorb, um, but given the, just the vast quantity of material that's been brought to the site um, in order to construct it, it, it seems to be likely that it would be well, well buried. Uh, Nick also did work uh, at Loch Migdale Cranagh, um, uh, it, which was commissioned by Time Team. And you can see um, uh, Baldrick there scrambling across Loch Migdale Cranog in his, um, uh, in his wellies. Uh, the work there comprised, uh, Nick's work there comprised a, a small scale underwater excavation, just a couple small trenches um, around the edge of the Cranog, found all the classic uh, Iron Age Cranog stuff of oak and alder timbers, some vertical piles, uh, um, uh, sunk into the lock bed and some horizontal timbers as well as kind of the typical organic matrix of bracken and, and uh, uh, other material. Uh, and a couple of radiocarbon dates from those two trenches revealed an early Iron Age phase, 800 to 400 BC, uh, as well as uh, a later Iron Age phase in the first centuries AD. All very typical Iron Age Cranog stuff uh, uh, that Nick uh, had done work on in Loch Tay. It parallels uh, many of the sites in Loch Tay quite closely, as well as sites in Loch Awe uh, and elsewhere in Scotland. A couple of years after the, the Loch Migdale excavation, Graham Cavers undertook a survey of, of Cranogs in Cape Ness. This was in part uh, uh, um, for renewed interest in a, in a national program of, of understanding wetland archaeology in Scotland, the Scottish Wetland Archaeology Program. Um, and Graham tried to do, to do a, a quite expansive uh, uh, overview and survey of these sites, um, including a uh, submerged survey of Loch Watton, Cranog, uh, as well as a number of others at Scarmaclate, Loch Calder, um, Loch of the Yarrows, uh, where he looked at the Cranog, as well as the, the brock that sits on the shore of that loch, and did some documentary research on um, possible other Cranogs uh, in some drained locks uh, and some islands in, in extant locks as well. Um, unfortunately, nothing uh, in Cape Ness has, has kind of uh, been spurred on from this. Uh, certainly a region that could, uh, that could use uh, a, a new Cranog project, a new Cape Ness Cranog survey um, uh, is absolutely justified 14 years on from, from Grand Caver's uh, initial uh, work. Uh, 
this kind of sporadic um, uh, work also extends to, to my own underwater foray in um, uh, uh, Cranogs and Highland region. Um, this was a, a, a very opportunistic uh, little piece of work that I did with support from uh, the Comparative Kingships project uh, that Professor Noble runs in, in the University of Aberdeen, as well as support uh, from the Living on Water project, which I was um, uh, employed on uh, at uh, the Scottish University's Environmental Research Centre. And this was very opportunistic because the lock was disappearing, um, as you might have seen in the headlines at the time in, in uh, early summer 2019, the level of the lock dropped quite dramatically uh, and this was concerning to the people who uh, lived around the lock and used the lock as a, as a fishery. Um, a, there was some untoward suggestions about why this was uh, regarding um, uh, drilling and, and other types of development. It seems almost certain that it's related to a very complex uh, hydrology of this lock. Um, it's quite un unique and unusual in that it doesn't have an outlet or an inlet stream. Uh, it seems to be entirely fed by groundwater. Um, and uh, uh, an unusually dry winter uh, and spring led to the fall of this um, lock. And the concern was that that might have uh, uh, an impact on uh, sensitive archaeological remains on the Cranog. Um, and so that's why we went out to, to check to see um, if any organic timber or organic um, uh, 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 material was exposed um, to drying out. And it turns out that no, that's not the case. Everything was very safely submerged, um, seeming to suggest that the, that level uh, of water had been present uh, in the lock at least for a, a short amount of time or, or potentially quite extended period of time in the past. Um, a, we opened up a couple of very small trenches. And when I say opened up trenches, we, we moved a couple of rocks um, and uh, found plenty of timbers making up this uh, Cranog site. Uh, and our rangefinder radiocarbon date indicated uh, a phase of construction in the 11th or 12th century AD. And that is the sum total of, of underwater investigations of Cranogs uh, that I've been able to find published in the Highland region. Um, uh, not systematic and certainly does not follow the spirit of Blundell's really enthusiastic um, uh, diving exploits. So moving on to Blundell's putting dots on the map. Um, and I've shown, I've, I've displayed this, illustrating this with this uh, slightly uh, warped perspective uh, for a reason, um, which is the putting dots on the map has been criticized uh, quite rightly in some respects for being a bit of a stamp collecting exercise. What does just finding more sites tell us about the phenomenon of, of building and living on uh, uh, an island? Um, and on its own, it doesn't tell you much. That is absolutely true. Um, however, of all the places to put more dots on the map, uh, the Highland region would be absolutely the place to do it. And that is because in terms of the distribution of Cranogs, the Highland region is absolutely central. Um, we find Cranogs from Shetland to County Cork in Ireland, um, and the Highlands is right in the middle of that. And given the um, hundreds and hundreds of locks uh, uh, in this region that simply haven't been explored, um, it, the chance of finding a large number of cranogs is very high. And that has a bearing on um, understanding uh, exactly what this distribution means, particularly when we start to bring in information about the chronology of these sites um, and uh, uh, you know, where and what type of inspiration different groups of people were using for the reasons why they would feel the need to live on an island. Um, so of all the places to put more dots on a map, um, I would say the Highland region uh, is absolutely the place to do it. On top of all that, the last person to actually systematically go about it um, was arguably Blundell. It's been a hundred plus years since anybody's really done a systematic survey to identify more Cranogs in this area. Um, so we're long overdue for it. Um, and a good place to start would actually be to go back to Blundell. Um, there are a number of sites that Blundell mentions and highlights uh, that are not on uh, the Canmore National uh, Historic Record of, uh, Record of the Historic Environment, uh, or indeed the Highland uh, Historic Environment Record. Uh, this includes Loch and Lune de Vrah, uh, 
in a very uh, fairly remote place near Ben Nevis. Um, looking on uh, satellite image, it seems like a crannog to me um, in terms of its size and its shape, what it looks like it even has what I uh, think is probably a boat noosed. Um, that's pretty classic uh, medieval or post medieval feature of, of crannogs. So expanding that out further, um, I'm very happy to, to say that uh, there's a, a, a keen local kayaker um, who's reported a handful of Cranog sites in the Highland region uh, in the past few years, uh, including one at Loch uh, Nostari near Malig. Um, there are many, many more small islets that I can find on uh, various satellite images, such as this one in, in Loch Meadie in Sutherland. Um, you'd obviously have to get in the water uh, and uh, put on a snorkel or a scuba gear uh, to go check it out um, to see if it's indeed artificial, but I would be quite surprised actually if this particular example at Loch Meadie isn't a crownog. It just has um, a very, very strong characteristic of, of what these things look like um, on satellite images. Um, and there are dozens and dozens and dozens of these small islets that uh, you can find uh, zooming around on, on satellite images that need, um, need inspected because uh, I suspect that uh, at least a significant portion, if not the majority of them, are probably crannogs. Um, there's also a handful of sites uh, reported by Bundell that just haven't been seen or located since. Um, this includes uh, uh, Loch Fidurish uh, in Strass Bay. Uh, Blundell reports it. He reports going to visit it and seeing it, um, but I can't find it on satellite images. I've walked around um, Patulish. I've not seen it, um, uh, uh, but he seems pretty clear that he was there. He was invited by the landowner and they, they went to it and saw it, went out on a boat, but it's not there. Um, so uh, that's another sort of uh, category of these sites that probably deserves um, following up on to identify more of. Um, Stymied excavations. Um, we'll start with, with uh, really the most expansive and um, uh, complete excavation of a crannog in, in the Highland region. That's a red castle um, in the Bewley Firth. So this is a marine crannog, um, which is not necessarily representative of the majority of crannogs. In fact, Alex Hale um, argues that marine crannogs might in fact be doing something fundamentally different to freshwater crannogs. Um, it was excavated in, in, I think, the late 90s or early 2000s, um, published in 2004. Um, it, it had quite uh, uh, interesting um, pits that were wattle lined, so, so um, small diameter timbers that had been woven together um, and lined this pit uh, that uh, Hale uh, interprets as, as serving some kind of processing craft processing function, perhaps related to leather working. Um, that interpretation of leather working, working is based on the fact that there was quite a substantial faunal assemblage from Red Castle, as well as um, uh, uh, animal footprints preserved in the mud uh, underneath the, the crannog layers. Uh, and in addition to that, a, uh, a small fragment of leather uh, was recovered from that excavation. It's also notable as the most extensively radiocarbon dated crannog in the region. Uh, has a series, quite robust series of radiocarbon dates, um, certainly for the period in which uh, uh, Hale was uh, excavating the site. Uh, this is a really good um, uh, assay of radiocarbon dates, um, and it points to, to um, uh, the fact that you could you could really go back and do a lot more, I think, with, with Red Castle um, and the assemblage, um, uh, given that you've got really good existing uh, corpus of radiocarbon dates, um, uh, there's probably a lot more that could be done by revisiting this particular site. Uh, and indeed, uh, Alex Hale has pursued that with his work on uh, the Clyde Firth Cranogs uh, with an old colleague of mine, P Peter Jakobsen, um, uh, doing exactly as I described, going back and revisiting the site, taking more uh, material for dating, um, which has uh, resolved a few chronological questions. So something like that could absolutely be done here at Red Castle. A small scale excavation of my own uh, at the, the Lock of the Clans. Uh, this was uh, really to uh, check how this site had changed in the 150 years since the lock had been drained. Um, it changed in a very negative way in terms of the preservation of organic remains. Um, there's almost nothing left of uh, what was originally reported by uh, a doctor named John Grigger um, in the 1860s of uh, timber platform and uh, roof purlins and, and all sorts of structure. All of that seems to be gone. Um, now just a compacted organic mass uh, really good composts effectively, 
um, with uh, uh, bits of charcoal, um, uh, not unlike what you'd get on a, on a terrestrial site. Um, and these were radiocarbon dated, provide pretty tight uh, uh, grouping of dates in, in the first century AD. Um, just two dates, so couldn't, uh, and a very small scale trend, so couldn't rule out other phases of use at this site. But uh, with that said, um, uh, two dates uh, that tight together would suggest um, uh, fairly um, uh, tight phasing. Um, there's also a second Cranog that was reported from this uh, lock, Lock the Clans 2, um, by Grigor. Uh, in looking for it, I couldn't find it. Um, but it would be well worth um, another look and perhaps a program of coring to try and identify uh, the second crown org that, that was reported in, in the 1860s and hasn't been seen since. Um, and a, a final crown org excavation in, in the region that I can um, uh, uh, report is uh, Loch Na Clash uh, in Assent. Uh, this is an excellent example of a, a local um, archaeology group um, uh, sort of pushing forward research here, very much in that spirit of, of Blundell's public archaeology, um, excavated with help from AOC archaeology and Graham Cavers in, in 2016. Um, small scale uh, uh, trench and uh, pretty typical of uh, northern and, and western Scottish Cranogs of being substantially stone built, although I think there was some timber as well, and a couple radiocarbon dates suggest uh, activity in the, the last centuries BC. Um, and that's uh, uh, it, I'm afraid, to report in terms of excavation of Cranogs in Highland. Um, not a whole lot. Uh, and so, unfortunately, in this respect, uh, following uh, in Blundell's um, uh, uh, legacy there with um, slightly stymied and, and never um, fully realizing the potential of, of Cranog excavations in this region. Artificial or not? Um, so this is something that's been uh, occupying uh, a lot of my research uh, on Cranogs recently. Uh, I've been doing some work in, uh, I've done some work in Shetland and have finally gotten that uh, written up and published um, or will be published shortly rather. Um, and, and that's this question about what actually constitutes a Cranog. Um, uh, in, certainly we can, as archeologists, we can sort of create tight definitions that it has to be composed of timber and stone and be set out from the shoreline. Um, but does any of that actually matter to the Iron Age builders of these monuments? Um, and I suspect very much that the answer is no. Uh, and, I, and I draw on evidence um, from sites like this at Loch Rannag and, and Cape Ness, uh, where while you have what is ostensibly a, a brock on a promontory, uh, it's been cut off by a, dish, a ditch and, and set out into the loch, in effect, creating an island. Um, and I would argue that you could, you could probably put this in the broad category of, of Cranog um, on the basis that it, it's maybe a bit of a false equivalency to consider Cranogs and Brocks as comparable types of um, uh, uh, domestic architecture. Um, it would be, for example, uh, in other words, like comparing a bungalow um, and a house with a large garden. They can exist simultaneously, although they don't have to. Um, uh, and the fact that we've grouped and categorized for purely historical happenstance reasons um, uh, is not very helpful in trying to understand, certainly in the Iron Age, why somebody would choose to build a Cranog versus a Brock, um, because I don't think that actually was necessarily a choice. Um, the, the question was, is would you build out into the water? Um, and we can see that really clearly, and, and please forgive the excursion to Shetland here, um, we can see that really clearly where they have ostensibly built a Brock as a Cranog. Um, in this case, uh, at the mid home of Hogolin uh, on the West mainland, um, there is a clear Brock uh, structure on top of uh, an artificial island. Um, a, there are many, many more examples uh, from the Western islands uh, uh, where you have dunes built on top of entirely artificial islands. Um, and uh, this slots very nicely into arguments made by um, Cranog scholars like Robert Lenford uh, and also Graham Cavers who've, who've argued along similar lines um, that uh, artificial uh, and, and sort of defining space set out into water is perhaps the most important defining feature of these things rather than uh, what the superstructure architecture is, whether it's stone or timber, whether it's a brock or a dune, etc. Um, 
And we can see that uh, if we return to, to the Highland region as well with uh, that example from Loch and Nostari uh, as well, we have what is ostensibly an entirely artificial cranog set in the middle of the loch, um, uh, but yet there were plenty of opportunities to um, occupy uh, a natural island uh, in this loch. So why go through the effort? Uh, and I think that relates to the fact that there's potency um, in, uh, uh, in building out uh, on the water, building an artificial space. And that's really what is the defining feature of Cranog. So in that way, I think we've, we've moved on from Blundell um, in sort of classifying artificial or not, um, uh, but actually it's the artificialness that is really the important bit. Um, uh, so chronology, chronology has obviously moved on. We've touched on this a little bit, um, but I will just put in a plug here to, to say that I think we can forgive Blundell's medieval presumption, um, given the types of cranogs that he uh, saw, um, sites like Loch and Dorb, um, and uh, the types of sites that he saw in the documentary record, um, such as this one uh, on the Pont map, which dates from the late 16th century, um, showing Loch Shin here, um, with a, a small island with a castle on top. I, I think we can forgive Blundell for his presumption that these, these sites were strictly medieval. Uh, you just don't know, uh, you particularly don't know underwater um, uh, if a timber is a thousand years old or 2000 years old or 3000 years old. Um, so at this point, we'll, we'll move into the final part of the talk and, and I'll rattle through um, the various periods and the questions that I have uh, about Cranogs in those periods. Beginning in the Neolithic, um, so far, there are no Neolithic Cranogs known in the Highland region. Um, until just a couple of years ago, there were no, there was only one Neolithic Cranog known in all of Scotland, and that was uh, Ellen Donnell in, um, in the Uist uh, that was excavated by Ian Armit uh, about 30 years ago. Um, since then, uh, through uh, amateur uh, divers finding uh, Neolithic ceramic sherds around some of these islets, uh, it became clear that there um, was likely to be uh, Neolithic Cranogs and, and a new project uh, instigated by Duncan Garrow and Fraser Sturt at uh, Reading and Southampton universities respectively uh, is investigating these uh, as we speak. Um, and there is now a corpus of, of sites uh, uh, that have this obvious Neolithic activity, both in terms of ceramics, but also radiocarbon dates from structural timbers on these sites. Um, you can see the, the, the ceramic fine spots on the, the map on the left there and the red dots. Um, so it's kind of scattered around the lock bed. Um, uh, they're finding these incredible um, uh, half bowls of, of Neolithic uh, 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 pottery, which is really incredible. Um, but so far, uh, totally restricted to Lewis, the US, uh, and there's one on Isla as well uh, that's been excavated by um, a, 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 uh, another team, not uh, part of Duncan and, and Fraser's project. Um, so if we do find Neolithic Cranogs in Highland region, uh, there will be many questions to ask, uh, and I will leave the majority of those to Neolithic and, and maybe Bronze Age specialists um, to ask and, and answer. Um, but one question that I do have is, is what exactly is the connection, cultural or otherwise, between these earlier prehistoric Neolithic Cranogs and Iron Age? Um, Cranogs. And, and to my mind, there need not be any um, direct connection at all, um, other than the fact that um, Iron Age Cranog builders may have been aware um, of these artificial islands um, uh, in the locks that they encountered um, some you know, millennia later. It's worth pointing out here as well is that there's absolutely zero evidence uh, for Bronze Age occupation of Cranogs across Scotland. There's just a couple of stray radiocarbon dates that seem to indicate a little bit of activity, um, uh, but there's no unequivocal construction and occupation of Cranogs through the Bronze Age. It's only in the Iron Age uh, that they reappear, and they this is the main um, sort of uh, focus of, of uh, Cranog building, um, seemingly from the radiocarbon evidence, uh, at least. Uh, the vast majority of radiocarbon dates are Iron Age. Um, the Questions I have about Iron Age Cranogs can, can be summed up uh, in this slide uh, uh, and in this image here of uh, Loch Benacharan uh, in Strathcairn. Um, and that relates to how Cranogs sit within uh, their wider uh, uh, settlement landscape. We, uh, at Loch Benacharan, we have 
Cranog, which you can see the shadow of in this uh, satellite image here at the end of the loch. Um, just a few hundred meters away is a Brock or a gallery dune. Um, and the question is, you know, are these uh, two settlements contemporary? Um, if they are contemporary, what does that mean for the economy and the society of this fairly remote um, and I think what we would call uh, today marginal um, uh, farming landscape? Um, does that say something about the climate or the environment at that time um, as being a little bit more amenable? Um, and, and what does that say about two, you know, fairly ostentatious uh, and showy uh, forms of house architecture being so close together? Um, what does that say about the society of this valley um, uh, and the social relations between them? If they aren't contemporary, um, uh, and let's say they're sequential, um, you know, why does uh, one generation or several generations later move from a crown to a Brock or a Dune? Um, you know, what is the choices behind that and, and what would prompt those changes? Um, or the final option is that these two sites are separated in time by many decades or centuries, um, in which case are we looking at um, changing patterns of uh, the adoption of settlement architecture? Um, and I would say uh, on balance, this certainly possible, um, but the least likely to my mind of the, the three possibilities um, on the basis that uh, when these landscapes have been interrogated, it does seem to be that there's repeated use at both of these sites within a century, um, within living memory of each other, um, and settlement seems to be moving around. That's certainly the paradigm that was uh, uncovered at Colts Lock in southwest Scotland by Graham Cravers and Anne Crone, um, uh, uh, and is seemingly uh, emerging at Loch Tay through uh, the work that I've been involved with, with the Living on Water project. Um, there are a range of other Iron Age Cranog questions that we had uh, of Cranogs in the Highland region. Um, I've put a few up there. Um, uh, you know, there's a, a huge uh, um, uh, scope and, and the, the Iron Age seems to be really at, at the precipice for the Highland region with the, the handful of excavations that have uncovered good Iron Age dates, uh, Red Castle, uh, Lock of the Clans, Lock and Clash. Um, there is uh, seemingly we're on um, we're just a, a couple steps away from a really good Iron Age Cranog research um, uh, project going on in uh, the Highland region. Uh, and all of this needs to be set within the context, I think, uh, um, of what we know about um, uh, Iron Age relationships to wetland environments. And, and that's really well illustrated by the Balahulish figurine. Um, uh, she's looking... Um, much better uh, in that photograph on the left there when she was first discovered in the 19th century um, compared to, to what she looks like now in the National Museum. Um, uh, but all of these questions about settlement and, and economy um, do need to be put within the context of, of what we know, which is limited, um, but what we know about uh, Iron Age relationships to these environments, which gets a little bit weird. Um, this particular artifact was found um, uh, in a bog face down uh, with water work um, uh, around it um, uh, in, in uh, slightly uh, uh, parallel circumstances to some of the ways that we've found uh, bog bodies in other parts of Northwest Europe and Ireland, Denmark. So moving on uh, to the early medieval period, um, this is very much a blank space on the map um, in terms of uh, Highland Cranogs. There are essentially no early medieval radiocarbon dates uh, indicating phases of construction of use of Cranogs in this period. Um, you'll see on the map one box, that's the one first millennium AD date from, from Red Castle um, uh, uh, in the Bewley Firth. Um, so there's essentially no kind of properly dated early medieval Cranogs in the region. Um, there are half a dozen at least likely examples. So I'm not suggesting here that people weren't building Cranogs uh, at that time in this area. Uh, they almost certainly would. A good example I've, I've highlighted here is uh, Ellen Callum Kill in uh, uh, the former Loch Monkstadt. It's a very evocative name, suggesting medieval and potentially early medieval um, activity. Um, but there are other good examples, Loch Ruffin, uh, not far from Inverness, a handful of the, the Caithness um, Cranogs uh, seem likely to my mind to have early medieval phases, um, but really just need to get out there uh, and get dating some of these sites to find them, I think. Um, 
And as we do that, uh, uh, how those sites fit into the new paradigms for early medieval settlement that have been revealed through fantastic work of Northern Picts and Teradel through time uh, and Port Mahomet, um, uh, all of these, you know, this real explosion of information we have about the early medieval period, um, particularly around the Murray Firth, but elsewhere as well. Um, uh, uh, you know, how do Cranogs fit into that uh, new evidence um, uh, would be a really good place to start with, with this type of work and, and see how that compares to um, some of the other early medieval sites uh, that we know about in Western Scotland and, and the rest of Scotland. And finally, in the medieval period, um, uh, whole series of, of other questions to be asked here. Um, this is once again getting back into Blundell's territory. Um, lots of uh, historic references to um, the great and the good of Scotland in the, in the medieval period, visiting certain sites here and there, um, and there's merit uh, and good work um, to be done investig investigating those uh, linkages. Um, but one of the questions I have uh, relates to a site that Blundell first investigated at, at Loch Trigue called Kepix Council Island. Um, it was laterally excavated ahead of a hydroelectric scheme. Um, and more recently has been redated, um, and it appears to be solely medieval in date. Uh, and this is a question that I would, I would like to ask is, are there more strictly medieval cranogs? So far of, of all the medieval cranogs that have been um, robustly radiocarbon dated, uh, most of them have shown um, phases of earlier use in the early medieval or the Iron Age. Um, and uh, Capix Council Island in Loch Trig sort of stands out uh, as, as an odd one in, for being strictly medieval. So that would be a question I have is, are there more strictly medieval sites? Um, another question is, is how common was permanent uh, or lower status medieval chronog settlement? Um, the historic documents seem to suggest that uh, the vast majority of Cranog occupation uh, was um, uh, seasonal for hunting lodges, uh, such as uh, Ellen and Falleg uh, in Loch Brora here, um, uh, or sort of visits just occasionally turning up um, and uh, using the Cranog um, as a staging point um, or um, a, a stop off point on a pilgrimage. Um, this is what most of the historic records seem to suggest. Um, so is there lower status settlement and, is, and what's the nature of that? Is it permanent or seasonal? Um, and again, likely to be many more questions to be asked here. Um, a, and a real burning question I have about the medieval period is what happened to that Loch Kennelan assemblage um, excavated by Hugh Fraser in 1914 and 1915? I haven't been able to find any reference to it in, in most of the major museum collections around Scotland. Um, but I, I have to believe that some of it, just because of how big it was, survived somewhere. Uh, and it would be really good to track it down uh, and potentially do more work on it. Uh, and the late and post medieval period, this is something uh, that doesn't get a lot of attention in Cranog scholarship in Scotland, certainly, um, is the kind of afterlife, uh, after the sites go out of use as actual occupation um, uh, and dwelling sites, um, they, they have a life of their own. Uh, this particular sort of Wendy house or, or we, uh, Bruins Husi um, in Loch Shin, uh, isn't on a recognized recorded crown og, although looking at it, I strongly suspect it, it, it may very well prove to be one. Um, uh, but there's a whole series of other questions about uh, uh, sort of what that kind of afterlife of crown ogs was. Um, you know, what uh, uh, other types of, of um, uses have, have been identified in, in my own work. I've found otter traps on crown ogs in Shetland, um, uh, uh, sort of hunting blinds, um, uh, boat noosts, which we've seen. Um, uh, there's also a lot of local legendary associations to these places, and it would be very interesting to, to, to um, corroborate that archaeologically. Very close to my own research at present is how drainage and, and uh, 20th century uh, hydroelectric schemes have impacted the survival of, of Cranogs and Highland, something I've addressed a little bit in my own research, but definitely deserves more work. Um, and then uh, uh, for those of you interested in estate landscapes is, is how uh, the small islet became so um, important to um, uh, designed landscapes. Uh, and I would not be surprised uh, to find if, if some of those ideas of romanticism, which were forged in the 18th and 19th century on visits to Scotland uh, and to Highland Scotland, uh, uh, was informed in part by 
um, uh, uh, being in landscapes with crinoids. There are many, many more questions asked, which I've been saying again and again. Um, uh, uh, and I encourage you to um, go and participate in the Highland uh, Regional Archaeological Framework um, and go comment on the, uh, the draft stage um, uh, 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 research framework and, and go um, see if you can get uh, uh, questions that you might have about specific sites or um, uh, about Cranogs in general of, of the different periods um, into the, the scarf. I think that would um, uh, absolutely follow very much in Blundell's legacy of um, uh, uh, conducting public archeology. span um, and, and I would certainly not like to be uh, absolutely dominating um, uh, uh, the research agenda for Cranogs uh, uh, anywhere, um, uh, certainly in Highland as well. So just to, to summarize and kind of reflect on, on Blundell's legacy, um, his diving and, and systematic approach was um, absolutely groundbreaking for its time in the, um, in the early 20th century. Uh, I can't say that uh, we have followed up Blundell's legacy in spectacular fashion in the Highland region. Um, uh, most of the diving work on Cranogs has been taken, uh, taken place further south in Loch Tay, Loch Awe. Um, his systematic approach, again, uh, I think we've, we've slightly failed a little bit there. Um, most Cranog research in the Highland region has been sporadic, a little bit scattergunned. Um, one-off commissions for Time Team or Historic Scotland, etc. Um, we've done okay in some respects in putting dots on the map, but oh boy, is there a lot more to do in that regard, um, uh, given just how many locks there are in the region. Uh, the one place where I think uh, great strides have been made is, is in this question of, of whether or not uh, Cranogs are artificial and what that means. There is now quite a bit of scholarship uh, on this um, uh, in various places. Um, and I think uh, uh, in that way, we've, we've really moved on from, from where Blundell was. Um, and similarly with, with chronology, although not the chronology of Cranogs in Highland, um, this is coming from evidence from elsewhere in the country. Um, and I hope, uh, uh, just as a final note, that we continue with that legacy of, of public archaeology and Cranogs in, in the Highland region. And it would be great to see um, uh, uh, local groups uh, and uh, local people who are interested in Cranogs pushing forward the research agenda um, and asking their questions uh, of Cranogs uh, and archaeology more widely. Um, so on that note, uh, I will say thank you very much for, for your time and for listening. Uh, and uh, I'll try and answer any questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Michael. That was that was brilliant. Lots lots to say there. I'm just going to caution people to say we are going to be recording the questions. So if you don't want your face to be seen, keep your video off. For those of you who don't mind, you feel free to. Um, <clears throat> Feel free to, to put your, your videos back on. Um, is there anybody who has any questions that they'd like to start with? If so, I suggest that you uh, put it into the, the chat to start with. We've got a number who have, have started. I'll just um, start here with um, Elizabeth Johnson, who's asking, so there were probably numerous chronics in the Highlands, but the relationship to Brochs is still unknown. And I sort of a question that came to me to add on to that is that um, Bro Caith Ness is the Brock capital of, of, the, of the Highlands of, 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 and basically of Scotland. Surely there's got to be potential to check out some of these on, at, at Caith Ness. Absolutely. Um, there's uh, numerous examples of these kind of half Brock, half Cranog sites in Caithness. Um, the Loch of the Yarrows Brock and, and Loch Ranag, uh, which I've mentioned, which are these kind of Loch side sites. Um, there's a number, uh, um, there's an example of a, a Brock near Wick Airport that was excavated in the early 20th century, but it's been plowed out now. Um, a, but a, a analysis of the, the Roy Military Survey of Scotland um, suggests that that location may very well have been uh, a, a loch. Um, and uh, I would love to, to try and track that site down and check uh, to see what the relationship of that Brock site was in, re, uh, in relation to the former loch. Uh, it might have been Loch Side or it might have been an island 
um, in the lock. Um, there are a number of other examples like that. Um, and I think if you went and tracked down any number of those uh, um, sites that I've uh, had a quick uh, look at on um, various satellite images that uh, you would, if you pulled back some of the brush uh, and some of the fallen masonry would find some rock-like or dune-like features. Um, so uh, there absolutely is, is really good scope for um, tackling that question of, of how you define these sites and, and, and what Iron Age builders were actually thinking and building them uh, in Cave Ness specifically. Roland, you had a question. Uh, yes, Michael, I, I, we've just before you arrived, we were talking about um, some small islands that we know of that could well be Cranogs. Um, and, and the stamp collecting bit is quite attractive. Uh, it'd be really nice if, because uh, it's something that local community groups can do. But I was wondering um, how we would know whether, uh, without going underwater, how would we know whether a, a small island is actually a Cranog or not? So it's, it's difficult without going underwater, um, but there are options um, to go underwater that don't involve you putting on a dry suit, um, uh, thanks to GoPros um, uh, and um, uh, drones as well, getting uh, aerial images uh, like the satellite uh, shots that I've shown you um, can, can get you a long way um, towards sort of de demonstrating that they're artificial or not. But the best thing to do is to get out onto them and to assess the the quality of the stones um, uh, that are extant on the, uh, the islet. Um, so uh, essentially what you'd be looking for is um, kind of, I call man-sized stones, um, you know, the kind of the size that you would reasonably be able to pick up and lift into place. You won't get larger stones than that out onto these sites, um, typically, uh, certainly if it's a, an Iron Age site. Um, and you can kind of get a feel for it. Once you've seen enough cranogs, you, you get a feel for whether or not it's likely to be artificial. Unfortunately, the ultimate proof, you're going to have to get underwater and find um, some timber or some obvious structure um, to be beyond all doubt. Um, but there's, there's uh, uh, reasonable ways without doing that to get close or, or to get there uh, entirely. Thanks. And can I add a little bit to the end of that, a coda? Um, there's at least one NOSAS member who, who dives, Richard Guest. Um, so I'm just curious as to whether um, this is could be an association with local diving groups, whether they would be interested uh, Absolutely. In, in sampling. Yeah, it, there's, um, there's, you know, uh, scuba falls within um, the Scottish a Outdoor Access Code, so there's nothing to stop you from uh, getting out um, and getting in the water um, if you are qualified to, to dive recreationally. Um, it, gets a, it gets a little bit tricky when um, you're diving in collaboration with somebody who is at work um, uh, for health and safety regulations. Um, but if it's uh, entirely volunteer led and entirely volunteer executed, um, you're effectively diving under recreational um, uh, jurisdiction, if you will. Um, and that's much more straightforward in terms of uh, uh, regulations. Um, and it's a good way to go. Uh, and you can absolutely do it very safely. Cranog diving is some of the safest diving you can you can do in terms of um, uh, uh, archaeological diving um, in that if anything goes wrong, you can usually just stand up. <laughs> Susan, did you see that wrecked expeditions yeah. hand up? Do you want to unmute yourself and ask Rex ex Expeditions, please? Hi, I was just going to um, uh, say that um, I am a scuba diver and also I have worked on a Cranog site in Loch Tay with Nick Dixon. Um, but I also am running some member projects through the Nautical Archaeology Society. Mm -hmm. So if there are diving projects or sites that you would like to be explored by divers, I can certainly see if there's project teams uh, within your area to come and help with that. That's absolutely no problem at all. I'll leave my email on the, um, on the chat. Well, are you, um, sorry, Excellent. are you okay Thank if we you. then add that to the, the forum as well, so people can follow up on that? Yep, absolutely. Fine. Okay, that'd be great, because yep. that seems 
this is what we really need to do. It, it is in the spirit of Otto Blundell is to, to match the different groups and the different expertises together. That would be great. Had a question from, from Carrie. Are chronics ever found on rivers, Michael? Um, in as much as, as some of these locks are parts of rivers, yes. Um, uh, in kind of classic uh, riverine settings, uh, no. Um, there's obviously the Bewley, the, the Firth Marine Cranogs, you could maybe consider a river as well. Um, you do get Cranogs in river proper, uh, rivers proper in Ireland. Um, but by and large, those tend to be from an earlier prehistoric period. So as again, this, this question of, of relationship to the later prehistoric period um, and what they're actually doing. Um, but in Scotland, no, they tend not to be in, in rivers proper. Probably the closest would be Loch Brora, which is one of these um, locks that's, that's along a river. Um, Maybe following on from that, we have Annie is mentioning in Northern Ireland, there's a new archeological site type that's been identified, the Cranach Bon, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, i.e. an enclosure that's on the loch side associated with late medieval Cranachs from which Cranachs were accessed and were within which ceremonies of hospitality were initiated. <clears throat> Have any such sites been identified in the Highlands? No, um, uh, have not, not to my knowledge anyway, have been identified. Uh, it'd be very exciting. Uh, and I would suspect that that type of thing could very well be in the Highlands, but uh, I'm not aware of any that have actually been identified. Um, what has been identified at Colts Lock in Dumfries and Galloway uh, is an Iron Age Cranog um, uh, proper, sort of classic packwork Cranog with all the material just dumped on the lock bed and, and round houses built on top. Uh, in use at precisely the same time, uh, identified through radiocarbon Bayesian analysis uh, as a promontory fort, uh, so a, a peninsula into the lock that's been cut off by banks and ditches. Um, and it is virtually beyond reasonable doubt um, that uh, uh, those two settlement sites on the same lock were in use at the same time in the Iron Age. Um, so, uh, not related to the, the Crown of Bonn, uh, as you say, which uh, is depicted on a, a really fabulous map, by the way. I'm, I'm sure Annie is, is familiar with the map dated to the 17th century that depicts that exact uh, setup, uh, but I think under more martial circumstances. Um, but there seems to be an Iron, an Iron Age parallel um, where activity is taking place on a Crown of proper as well as a, 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 a lock shore um, structure settlement of some kind. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the nature of the relationship and why people felt uh, it necessary to do that. Um, uh, the authors of that monograph, uh, Anne Cronin and Graham Cavers, are, are fairly um, uh, quiet about. Um, it's definitely something worth pursuing because there are other examples of that uh, that probably date from the Iron Age or maybe the early medieval period. We also had um, <clears throat> a message from Anne Coombs, very, uh, very pertinent one to just say, don't forget that most of the Cranachs, a lot of the Cranachs in the Highlands are scheduled. And so therefore you need permission in order to, to do, before you do any work on them and remove anything, you need permissions. Yes, thank, thank you, Anne. That is, um, that is very good information to know. Um, it's certainly not the majority of Cranachs. The vast majority are unscheduled. Um, uh, uh, but yes, there are a number that are. Um, and so definitely, uh, before you go diving on a Cranach, it'd be worth double checking if it's scheduled or not and take the proper precautions there. Um, I had a question as well. Um, it just It seems to me that this is a no brainer, Michael. I mean, these sites, have such potential organically. They preserve, they have good dating, they have the potential to do environmental analysis. Why haven't we actually been pursuing this on the scale? Why are we just dipping in with a little trench here and a little trench there? Surely there is huge potential to get a lot of information for each of those periods you've been talking about. I mean, it's not really, I suppose, a question. It's, it's a, a plea, I suppose, in some ways. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 absolutely worth highlighting. Uh, I think some of it has to do with with just the history of Cranog research, which has been um, tied to um, big individuals who've had um, you know their kind of uh, their little patch, um, you know, at Loch Tay uh, in Southwest Scotland, uh, etc. 
Um, and uh, since Blundell, nobody's kind of staked out the Highland region as, as theirs to, to go for. Um, that's certainly a paradigm that I would like to see changed um, and Crown Og Research not led in that fashion. Um, uh, but uh, uh, I think cost has a big part to play in it. Um, uh, I think funders, um, traditionally archaeological funders have uh, uh, gotten scared by wetland sites and the potential cost implications of conserving and analyzing and caring for and storing um, large assemblages of waterlogged artifacts. Um, uh, but uh, through the Living on Water project uh, and the work uh, that's been done by uh, AOC archaeology, there are strategies in place that, that can minimize that risk. Um, and certainly for the Iron Age sites that have been investigated in the Southwest and, and even those at, at Loch Tay, the uh, artifact assemblages tend not to be enormous. Um, uh, so some of these uh, fears that there would be long-term cost implications are maybe slightly unfounded. Although you look at those photos of Loch Kennel and Cranog and um, uh, maybe uh, that brings you back to the possibility that there could be very substantial assemblages. But of course, that's the material that we need to do really great work on as well. So uh, very difficult. Um, uh, it's difficult to, to get the, the funding in place um, and, and difficult to get the right expertise on board. Um, but it, I think if it's being driven by um, local groups, I think that in the, in the current climate is likely to be the best, um, best way forward um, for uh, attracting funding and, and for doing it properly. A message from Peter, who's going back to our rivers again, just saying, beware that the assemblages of stones that you sometimes find in the rivers could be associated with netting fish, so that there can be other reasons rather than being a chronic, which is a fair point as well. I think it, you're likely to encounter that uh, in the marine cranogs potentially. Mm -hmm. um, ballast dumps might be confused for a possible cranog um, in those fishing structures as well. Uh, in a freshwater loch, um, I, you, you, you'll know. I think you probably know um, uh, whether you're looking at something that's likely to be a former uh, dwelling or settlement uh, as opposed to something else. Any other questions from uh, Roland? You're muted, Roland. Um, yeah, I'll have another go, Michael. I, I live just outside Bewley, and um, in the Bewley Firth, there are five, maybe six lumps called Cranogs. Redcastle is one of them. Um, I gather these are quite unusual in that they are maritime rather than fresh water. Um, and there's also a suggestion that some of them are, you know, maybe even 19th century, just um, places for um, marker, marker posts or, or, or lights to aid shipping. Um, do, you, do, do you have anything to say about the Bewley Firth Cranox? Um, anything yeah, about? so the, the authority is Alex Hale, um, and he's published in um, Society of Antiquaries of Scotland, um, uh, as well as his book. Um, and he's got pretty good sweet dates, not only from Red Castle, but there's a, a couple, one or two of the other Bewley Firth um, Cranox have radiocarbonates, and I'm pretty sure they're both Iron Age. Um, mm -hmm. They definitely like, um, uh, I highlighted, uh, have these kind of afterlifes of, of uh, you know, attracting various activities, fishing, um, navigation, um, etc. cetera. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me at all if, if that's the case at all of them, um, at certainly at some of them, um, including at Red Castle, which Christian McLagan, the um, very famous um, sort of first female archeologist in Scotland, uh, apparently reports that um, uh, uh, defeated Jacobites took refuge on Red Castle following Culloden. Um, that seems a bit bizarre to me because you would not be particularly protected or hidden, <laughs> exposed on a mud flat. But um, Alex Hale mentions that. Um, and uh, uh, so, yeah. Um, uh, but uh, the, the couple of radiocarbonates suggest they, they originate as Iron Age cranogs. Um, but I don't think they all have um, radiocarbon dates. Um, and there are, there are the other marine cranogs in, in the Clyde, um, which are Iron Age, uh, and in a couple other places. 
Um, Robert Monroe excavated one near Oban, um, which had, a, I think, a couple Iron Age finds. Thanks. Do we have any other questions for Michael? In that case, I'll, I'll just sort of draw it to a close, just sort of saying it seems to me that we've got lots that we can start doing even before we can get these mega projects on the go. Um, John is, has typed into the chat that he lives four miles from Petulish and climb the hill above it. He's going to go have a look. And I think there are scope for just looking at your area, looking, read. I mean, Blundell's work is very accessible. Um, read and find out the ones he identified. See if you can find things that are happening other other places there. Um, and you know, this is basically in scope to ask around. I, I too have asked around about Lock Canal and Michael, and I don't, nobody has any clues where those finds were, and there we've done so many. But there are scope for things that are found by people around this, so we can also try to get the word out. So there's so much potential in Chronics, and I think um, I really like the idea of Otto Blundell being our, one of our first public archaeology. And, and it really sets the tone for, for what was happening here in the Highlands. So I just want to say thank you very much for an excellent presentation, really thought-provoking, and do encourage people to go and, and use the forum, contribute to the forum. We can take some of these, these questions and develop them forward and put some other references as well. For example, we can put the, the PSAS references to Blundell's work and get some of that for people there. So thank you very much. Thank you.